This is a Anti Bits production. And he figures this is the best way to make his grandfather proud. But Yayo lets it slide so long as the chrono continues to produce. Factio's network is so well established that it pretty much runs itself. Wait, we've got movement. Looks like we need that convoy. Radio truck and escort. There's gear in that radio truck that could make life a lot easier for the Rebels. You want to go after it? Combo gear's in good shape. We'll pass on the location of the truck to the Rebels. <laughs> Shit balls. Outside the province, rubbing shoulders with politicians in Sucre, and greasing the wheels for the cartel. Not really his job, but the guy's something of a charmer, and he figures this is the best way to make his grandfather proud. But Yayo lets it slide so long as the Coro continues to produce. The fact is, the network is so well established that it pretty much runs itself. El Emissario's assistant handles the rest. Get in there, gather intel on Okoro's production sites, and start fucking things up. That'll put pressure on El Emissaria to come back to El Coro and get things back on track before Granddad finds out. When that happens, we grab him and use him to get to El Yeo. Getting an upload from Bowman. Looks like she's got some intel on El Emissaria. You all know El Yayo, highest ranking Bolivian in the Santa Blanca cartel, and their head of cocaine production. But you may not know his grandson. Gonzalo Yana, a.k.a. El Emisario, the Emissary. Yayo taught Emisario everything he knows. How to produce the best polvo in all of South America, how to maintain relationships with the local Bolivians, and most importantly, how to serve your Santa Blanca masters. Emisario looks up to Yayo, would do anything to honor him, to make him proud. Which is exactly what makes El Emisario the perfect target. His greatest fear is shaming his grandfather. If we hit his coke operation in Okoro, he'll come running back to fix things. That's when we grab him. With a little luck, he'll give us everything we need to know about dear old grandpa.
They're coming right at us. What's the word, boss? Familiarize yourselves with Bowman's briefing on Santa Blanca's coke production pipeline. Metal has a coca plant on it. That's kind of cool. Yayo was born amidst the Bolivian coca. His mother carried him on her back until he was old enough to go to work for himself. For decades, Yayo picked the leaves, fingers blistered, back aching, feet bleeding. But never, in all that time, did he once extract the alkaloids to make cocaine. To Yayo, the coca leaf was an ancient tradition, going back 8,000 years, a medicine, a culture, una planta sagrada. Of course, the Americanos had a different opinion. They called it Plan Dignidad, the Dignity Plan. Although Yayo was no more than a farmer, un cocalero, his world was left in ruins. With no other means available, he was forced to do the one thing that he vowed never to do. He was forced to produce cocaine. In the end, the Americans' efforts to stop cocaine production created one of the greatest cocaine producers to ever live. Familiarize yourselves with Bowman's briefing on Santa Blanca's coke production pipeline. People of the top. This document mentions a new Nidad captain who sends prisoner to Yuri and Pluto for interrogations. He's got to know where our lovebirds are, but he's sitting in the new Nidad fire base. Hold up. Tango down. Clear. How are you guys holding up? Let's go. Got a cartel supply plane loaded and ready to go. You can't turn down a gift like that. Rebels are damn sure like to have what's inside. Get down! Blanca gives out a lot of these.
Alpine. Ranger, I leave out in my neck of the woods, and he decided he wanted to get himself a pair of alligator boots. But you know, we're talking a ranger here. He wasn't going to go to no shoe store. No, he gets himself a knife and heads out to the bayou to get him a gator and make some boots for himself. So he gets off the highway and heads back into the country and finds a little old bait shop near the edge of the swamp. He asks the man where he can find himself a gator, and the man gives him directions into the bayou. This doesn't end with banjo music, does it? Just let me tell the story, okay? Anyway. The guy at the bait shop says, Look here, while you're out there, keep an eye out for these two Marines I sent in a couple days ago. They were after gator boots too, and they should have been back by now. Ranger says, uh, he'll keep an eye out for them, and heads into the bayou. He follows the man's directions and heads way out into the swamp. When he gets to where he's going, sure enough, he sees these two Marines standing up to their waist in the water. Over on the shore nearby, there's like 20 dead gators in the mud. Now, as the Ranger watches the gator... up to the Marines. This jarhead jumps on the gator, kills it with his knife, drags it up on the shore, flips it over, and looks at the gator's feet. He said, damn it! This one ain't got on no boots either. Class A uniform. Obviously, it's nothing as softball as waterboarding, right? I mean, we're talking permanent damage and death here. They're also medically trained, so you have to figure there are some pharmaceuticals at work to keep their victims awake. See, back in the day, the real torturers didn't need drugs to keep their victims awake. So they're amateurs. That's obvious from how few people survive their interrogations. The real torturer, a professional, he or she is in control. He or she understands what's needed. You're in Polito or sloppy. They get carried away. 
They do it for the fun of it, not because it's a job and not for the art. So yes, they're brutal, but not because they try to be. They're brutal because they're incompetent. <laughs> You've got a dark side hidden under that smile, don't you? Missions over. We're done.